Thank you very much, uh, Lata, for these uh, very kind words. I feel honored to speak here to you today and to discuss a question that um, keeps me up at night. Um, and this question is, what uh, challenges does digitalization pose to our discipline to international legal scholarship? Now, note that I will not talk about international law as such, and Lata has already warned you, so be warned. If you want to talk about international law proper, then you're probably not in the right place here. Um, I'm talking about international scholarship, or if you wish, some would even call it international legal science. So, so this is my topic, and what is, what is digitalization doing to our discipline, to, to the discipline of international legal scholarship? Now, I want to argue that the main challenge of digitalization to international legal scholarship is a, uh, is a methodological one. Um, and um, so the methodological challenge I, would, I want to put up front here. Um, now, the structure of my talk... Is as follows. I want to take up two questions from my paper, uh, which are first, um, what does digitalization mean for legal scholarship in general? Um, so not just international legal scholarship, but legal scholarship in general. And in the second part, I will look at the question um, um, of how uh, data analysis can be gainfully, usefully applied to questions of international legal scholarship. Now, I come to my first part, so what does digitalization mean for legal scholarship in general? And here I would like to raise three points. So digitalization is, um, is or has turned, um, I would maybe even say has turned, into a key scientific impulse uh, also for legal scholarship. And as I said, I want to raise three points um, related to digitalization in our context. And the first is um, that we see processes of datafication or digitalization of law. The second point is we see a gradual rise in the automated um, information retrieval um, on, on, on law. And thirdly, as a result of all of this, and this I consider most important, is legal knowledge is becoming more and more differentiated. Or you could put this maybe in easier words, our discipline is becoming more and more diverse, um, pluralistic um, in its approach. Now, um, on the first point, on the datafication of law, uh, first of all, digitalization has to do with the massive production and the massive availability of digital data. Digital data is, um, as you all know, is computer read readable data. Um, now, the question that I need to answer first as a lawyer is, does it make sense at all to talk about um, something um, uh, such as legal data? Does it make sense to talk about legal data at all? And what the hell would legal data then be? Now, it is highly contro controversial whether there can be such a thing as legal data. Some legal scholars would reject outright the idea that legal data exists. And these critics point, usually point to the fact that law is not simply out there, it has no objective reality, rather they see law as a social construct. Uh, law, in their view, is not observer independent, it is not measurable. Now, <clears throat> while, while I think that this has credit, this view, um, I think it's um, an oversimplification. Law is, in my view, and in, in that of others, uh, multidimensional. Um, for example, the German legal philosopher Robert Alexi speaks of the double nature of law. Law, of course, has this critical dimension, this ideal or critical dimension. Any legal law makes a, uh, makes a legitimacy claim, uh, but law certainly also has this other feature um, of a social or factual dimension. And this also applies, of course, to international law. International law also is socially, socially effective. And this social effectiveness of international law is also empirically observable. Law always is also a social practice. The, take the decision of a court. Take um, even the stretching of hands at a wine auction. 
These are all manifestations of the social practice of law. Now, this social practice of law manifests itself in um, legal texts, in legal relationships, and in legal decisions. In other words, texts, relationships, and relationships and decisions ca um, uh, contain observable ca contain observable legal data. Um, and here's a definition that I find useful uh, by a um, uh, legal sociologist, Hugo Rottleutner, and he says legal data are law-related social facts. Now, the datafication of the law. The, at present, the datafication of law takes place at a rather, in a rather modest, uh, at a rather mo modest scale with rather modest objectives. Um, um, various actors are currently pushing for, for the datafication of law. Take uh, publishing companies that also publish ebooks, um, that take uh, Google Books and libraries, uh, all unwolfed here. But of course, and even more important, um, the central actors of the legal systems, uh, such as courts, uh, such as um, uh, the legislators, and of course the administration, all of them. Um, offer their decisions, their texts online as computer readable uh, data. In Germany, in Germany, um, starting from 2020, all files um, with the federal administration must also be must al must always be in electronic form. And I, I consider this is a huge step. Once all files are are also or only available only in electronic form, this is a this is um, this is a game changer in my view, and this is happening as we as we talk. Um, finally, and this is my main focus here, uh, legal scholarship is also um, increasingly involved in producing uh, legal data, or involved as an actor in the datafication of law. Um, scholars collect uh, legal data. For example, we in my research group we code judgments by the European Court of Human Rights and we turn the, these texts into computer readable data. Um, <clears throat> now, once you have these uh, computer readable data, what happens next is you apply, uh, you apply um, methods other than the uh, traditional hermeneutic um, text-based um, methods to, to these data. Um, and here I would talk about the automated information retrieval, uh, information retrieval um, about the law. And these methods obviously come from um, uh, quantitative methods uh, such as uh, use, uh, and use in statistics and econometrics. I will come to a few examples in a minute. Now I said the, 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 the most important point for me is that um, uh, the, the third aspect of digitalization, and this is that the automated information retrieval um, by which we gain, uh, now gain data-based legal knowledge. Um, we get new, a new form of legal knowledge, which we didn't have before. Um, and what is the added value of such a data-based legal knowledge? Um, data-based legal knowledge allows us to better understanding how international law works. Um, uh, the expectation is that an improved uh, knowledge of the social dimension of international law is meant to provide a better uh, basis for improvements in the lawmaking law and decision-making processes. And I will come to examples uh, uh, later on. Now, I admit that much of, um, much of what we are at the moment expecting, what would come from out of these legal data is only speculation. Um, all we can probably say at this point is that we can expect to see new correlations, new patterns um, by looking at, the, at these data, which then triggers new um, innovative legal scholarship. And what I found most, most striking is that this idea is um, all but new. Um, uh, it was actually coined a um, hundred years ago um, by uh, the American legal scholar Herman Oliphant, who said that and I quote, our case material is a gold mine for scientific work. It has not been scientifically exploited. We should critically examine all the methods now used in any of the social sciences and having any useful degree of objectivity. Now, let me come to my, the second part of my, my talk. And this is about um, uh, the question, how can we apply data analysis to questions that we, we ask in international law and international legal scholarship? Um, for us legal scholars, it 
probably makes most sense to start by digital, digitizing legal texts and see what we get out of this. Um, for example, we might um, want to digitalize um, international treaties and then examine the resulting textual data. Um, text mining is a quantitative method that is used um, for information retrieval um, uh, on, on digitized legal text. Um, text mining can be used to identify meaningful structures in complex, um, in complex data. Here you can see an example of a so-called word, word cloud, and this is often the starting point for, for, for further research. This is just a, you know, a very simple thing, very simple starting point. Um, if you have lots, uh, lots of treaties um, uh, or unstructured um, texts, then text mining is the first useful step to get um, into the patterns and, um, uh, of the, that, uh, that uh, are in there. One question that interests international legal scholarship, for example, is this. Um, what is the influence of one legal regime on another? And um, um, how closely are um, the two related also, uh, already on a textual level? And text mining can be used, to, to, um, can, can be used here. And one example of a fine study is a recent study by Ali and others that uses text mining um, for the study of WTO law. And they find that contrary to what is sometimes um, is what is sometimes suspected in the literature, multilateral WTO law is very much present in preferential trade agreements of individual states. So here, this text mining method is um, a useful tool to you know to 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 get a, a better grip at the fragmentation discussion that is um, ongoing in in the study of WTO law. Um, the second point is legal relationships as data. Not only text, but also legal relationships um, um, are revealing in this respect. Um, and, and they can be used for obtaining database information. Um, <clears throat> uh, relations between actors or relations between acts. And here's an example from my own research, which is a joint project by the University of Zurich and the Max Planck Institute um, of International Law in Heidelberg. Um, now, the project um, asks the questions, uh, the question basically, which um, violations of the European Convention on Human Rights typically occur together? So if you read hundreds of decisions by the European Court of Human Rights, you will see that there, is, there are violations that um, typically go together, that hang in a way together. They, you always see the same pattern, but you you know, you, you, you see it, you somehow know it, but you need to have other tools than just the hermeneutic text reading to actually say, well, these are um, uh, typical connections or typical structures in the data. And here, the so-called cluster analysis, which is a uh, statistical method, can be gainfully used, I think. Um, this dendrogram, so it's called, um, shows four clusters in the data, in the very first data that we collected, um, and I will, I will only briefly outline one of, of the clusters that are interesting here. You see that, um, um, you see that in, the, in, the, in the bottom par part of the dendrogram, you see that uh, freedom of expression and independent tribunal violations go together in a way. And the data shows that if the freedom of expression is violated, the right to an independent court is also violated in 30% of the cases of our sample, of course. Yeah, this is, uh, this is our, our data here. Um, the, uh, and one of the, for example, one of the cases that um, is in the sample here is that the complainant distributed leaflets on the subject of consent, conscientious objection to military service before the state security court in Ankara. Um, and the military judge was later involved in the conviction of the complainant. And the Strasbourg court came to the conclusion Article 10 is violated and Article 6 is violated. Um, so this is one of the clusters that we find in our data here. Um, and we can then talk about, okay, what happens if we know that there the, are these clusters? You can, for example, cluster on the basis of the state. And I find this very important. Then you can, if you know the, the, the typical violations um, that occur in your country, then you can possibly train um, prison staff. You can think of all sorts of policy implications by knowing the clusters of violations in your country. Um, okay, so this is, this is as much as I wanted to say on the cluster analysis. Um, um, 
Then uh, a final example here for automated information retrieval is about legal decisions. Um, there is there are there's, uh, man, many many studies on um, legal decision making um, in an empirical uh, dimension, and these studies typically examine the statistical relationship between a response variable and one or various uh, explanatory variables. So they try to find associations between these. Um, two categories of variables. Um, and these can be all sorts of things, gender. Oh. Okay, um, so I will hurry up here. Um, how much time did you say? A minute. A minute, okay. So, um, so what, what these studies do is a so-called regression analysis. Typical research, research questions are, um, and here I will take another one of our um, studies. Uh, we were interested in the question how does the European Court of Human Rights arrive at its sums of non-pecuniary damage, damages, um, and what are the factors related to uh, the amount of money that you get out of uh, these judgments um, when there, th there's one or more violations? So we, in a way, tested empirical doctrine here, and this is what I find important. We can talk about this in the, in the discussion. So we tested empirical doctrine here. Uh, we, we tested legal doctrine empirically. Um, um, one point on uh, a final point on um, a final point on what uh, on different differentiation of legal knowledge. Legal knowledge is becoming more differentiated because what you can do with this is you can do predictions. If there is a client coming to you and says um, these are my th these are my violations, um, how how much do I get for non-pecuniary damage? You can pretty accurately uh, if if the data is good say this is the amount, uh, amount of money you, you, you get. So I conclude the problem, the key problem to me by post by digitalization and international legal scholarship is one of method. Um, and I think in the resulting uh, discussion, we should uh, talk about, um, okay, what, what happens for, um, for teaching, what happens uh, for academia, for, for um, um, in, in the classroom, if we, if we accept that there is a problem of method involved here. Thank you very much.